Hi everyone, my name is Memo, this is my channel, House Planty Goodness, and essentially it's a place where I like to geek out about my big passion. You might be able to see some of it behind me, it's tropical houseplants. So for today's video, I thought I'd do a continuation on the weird plant video, and I'll link it up the top here for somebody who hasn't seen it. If you want to go and see that first, you can. But essentially, in this kind of mini-series, I would say, I highlight some house plants that are not the usual philodendron, monstera, anthurium that we see everywhere. Some of these can be quite affordable, some of them might be a bit harder to find, so might have a bit of a price tag to them, but they're not quote unquote rare plants where you would see huge, huge price tags, at least not in my location, which is in the UK or in the EU, basically. So these should be relatively affordable, if not a bit difficult to come by. And it's just because they might not be as popular, they don't bring them out as often. But yeah, there's going to be a good selection of plants in this video. There's a couple of uh, cordisiform plants, where essentially there's a cordex, and yeah, a whole host of different types of plants, and I don't think there's a philodendron, anthurium, or monstera in sight in this video. So without further ado, let's get into it. So starting off with one of the weirdest plants on this list, and this is the Solanum pyracanthum. And I'll insert clips throughout this entire section so you can see this plant up close because looking at it now through the viewfinder, it's not translating quite as nicely as I would like it. You might be able to see if I turn it around, it does have some lovely purple kind of blooms. It's also got some fruit coming along. And I will touch a bit more on that in just a second. So this is a plant that a lot of people probably haven't seen before. Now, this is a plant that I got, at least here in the UK, I got from Turnit Tropical. So this is a plant that probably most of you haven't come across. Select few probably have, and you're the kind of OGs, because you're looking at finding some weird tropical plants. But for everybody else, this is a nice little introduction to Solanums, and Solanums are part of the tomato family. And you can understand now when I was mentioning the fruit, and these plants do grow little fruitlets that do look a bit like tomatoes. These were probably the Solanums as house plants were a bit more popular back in the 70s and 80s where there was a big house plant boom. I think I've mentioned this one specifically in my podcast with Jane Perone for her podcast essentially. She had me as a guest speaker on the Ledge podcast. I will link that episode down below in the description as well if you want to check it out. And we talk about this plant and a few others as well and talk about their history as well. But yeah, it, these types of plants, the Solanums, were much bigger back in the day as houseplants. They've kind of lost a bit of vogue at the moment. But as I've mentioned, this one does fruit. So it does create little tomato type fruitlets, essentially. Uh, this plant for me actually sits the whole summer out in my greenhouse in the, and I can bring it out as well, I've had it outside in the garden in the UK in the summer and take it then into the greenhouse for the winter. I have also grown this plant in a household environment. The one thing I will say is it needs bright, bright light. And you might be able to see why when you look at the leaves, the leaves have got a slight pubescence on them, so a slight fuzziness to the leaves. And obviously the most striking thing that you can see about the leaves is those thorns. The thorns that go above the leaf and below the leaf, which is not something you see very, very often. So these are thorns or spines that look a bit like they could belong on a cactus. Now the second part of the name, the pyracanthum, and again, this is coming in from kind of ancient Greek. So the fire element of it, so the redness that you're seeing on the actual thorn itself is kind of reminiscent. The yellows and the oranges and the reds are very reminiscent of flames. So bir in ancient Greek means fire. And the thorn element of it is the other part of the name. So anganthi basically just means spine or spike or thorn in Greek. So the name pyracanthum 
literally means fiery thorns, which I think is great. I love when I find names that are just very descriptive of what the plant looks like. But in terms of care for this, I would say treat it like you would most of your other aroids. I've got it in my aroid soil mix. I do give it a lot more light than I would give my aroids. So the soil conditions are very similar to an aroid. It is part of the tomato family, so it does need to be watered. So you don't want it to ever stay dry, entirely bone dry for too long. You want to keep on top of that moisture without, it's, it's also not a fern, so it doesn't need to stay wet all the time, otherwise it will rot out. But other than that, give this as bright light as you can possibly give it. So think of where you would have your cactuses and succulents. That's the kind of light that it, you would need if you're growing it indoors. If you're growing it outdoors, obviously you just have it somewhere where it's getting a tiny bit of shade. We've talked about this on other videos when it comes to lighting. What might be bright, bright light in a house is still relatively shady outside. So do that and you'll get some good results with this one. One of the final things I want to say is that it does have some really interesting blooms on it as well. It does bloom quite readily for me, especially when I've got it outside. And it creates these beautiful kind of purpley flowers with a yellow stamen in the middle. I think it's called a stamen. I will correct myself here, if not. But yeah, and they, they don't have much of a fragrance to them, but they are very, very cool looking. And especially if you're growing it in the house, it's not very often that we get house plants with kind of interesting looking purpley flowers. I know there's a few exceptions here, but generally you don't get to see that very often. Now the next plant I wanna show you is actually a begonia. So this is a begonia and I do need to cut some of these older leaves off. This is gonna be a task for me after this video, but this is the begonia seismorii. And for those people that have been here since the very beginning of the channel, they've probably seen this. People that are on my Instagram have seen this as well. If you're not following me on my Instagram, my Instagram handle is up here and in the description below. Do join there because I tend to answer questions a lot faster there. I'm not on YouTube for longer than a couple of days after I upload a video. So if you do have a pressing question, that is where to find me. But yeah, essentially with the Seismorii, for the people that have been here for a while, they know that this is one of the few plants in my collection that I have actually nicknamed. And I don't generally name most of my plants because... Uh, uh, I barely remember the names of my friends and family. If I had to remember however many plants with all having their own unique names, uh, that would just never happen. <laughs> but the Begonia seismorii I call Chewy or Chewbacca, and it will make sense as we look at this plant in more detail. So with the Begonia seismorii, one of the first things that will kind of catch your attention about this plant, and also linking back to why I nicknamed it Chewy, is that pubescence and that slight hairiness, well, very hairy as well, I would say. So as I always say with slightly hairy plants, this is gonna be a Marmite situation. You're gonna either love it or hate it. I do love hairy plants. Again, not something I thought I would be saying online at any point in my life. <laughs> but they are, they've got very cool kind of fuzzy petioles. The leaves have also got some hairiness on them on the actual surface of the leaf, which you don't see very often. Sometimes you get that pubescence and that hairiness around the leaf, but never on the leaf itself. The other thing about it is on the leaf, it has got a bit of a silver band. And again, this is kind of blister variegation where there's a pocket of air between the layers on the skin of the actual leaf itself. But it doesn't, it's not a plant that you would get because it's a silver plant. You do get flushes of that silver happening through. It's not very bright either, but it does create a bit of interest on the leaves. The back of the leaves, however, as well, do have some really interesting markings. It's got some pinks, it's got some beiges, it's got some purples as well. So again, as we've mentioned before on this channel, with anything that's got kind of reddish, purpley, burgundy, backs to the leaves, you would assume that it needs slightly lower light levels because in nature it would be growing on the kind of forest floor, so it would have the canopy of trees above it shading it from above. 
And this does hold true for this plant as well. Generally speaking, I have found that it does prefer to have medium to bright indirect light, but not too bright of a light as well. Not that I find that it stresses it too much or that it crisps up too much. This, I have to say, is one of my hardier begonias, believe it or not. And it is a rhizomatous begonia as well, because most people know that cane begonias like a begonia maculata whitei, which is the polka dot begonia that you might see a lot of the times with the red backs. Those tend to be really, really kind of hardcore plants. You can grow them to the size of a tree. The plant that I was just showing you is actually my mother plant that I've had for over four years, probably going on five years now, actually. And I took a few propagations. One of the propagations of Chewy, which I call Chewy 2.0, because I'm not very inventive when it comes to names is actually behind me on the shelf there. You might, yeah, you can kind of see it there in the screen. I never move that out of there because Chewy 2.0 is now three or four times the size of the mother plant. Absolutely ridiculous. So I water it in situ whilst I try not to knock my monkey picture plant. It does bloom as with most begonias. The flowers are relatively insignificant. I find, as with most of my begonias, if I have it a bit pot bound, it will want to bloom a bit more. First year that I had it, I looked at the blooms, I wanted to see the blooms. Every time I see the blooms coming in now, I chop them off to release some of the energy back into the foliage. Because essentially with this plant, the foliage is where it is at. But the other thing that isn't as well known about this plant, and I, if I can, before I edit this video, I will see if I can put um, a clip in where you can see this. It's very tricky to capture this and it doesn't, you need to have just the right lighting conditions. So some people might have heard of the Begonia pavonina. And the Begonia pavonina became big and well known a few years back because it had a bit of a blue shimmer. People thought it was more blue. Again, that plant is very similar that you need very specific lighting conditions or very specific flashes from the camera to get that blue iridescence. This, even though this is never spoken about, does get that as well, I found sometimes. It tends to be on the very young and immature leaves as they're coming in before they start hardening off. And again, it needs to be the right lighting conditions. That's why I'm saying. <laughs> if I can get this on a video and I'll put a clip on here, great. If not, hopefully, if you're, if you're following me on my Instagram, I might post something on there when I do get it. It's very specific times when I get it, which also, for me, is a bit of a plus for this plant because it does kind of catch you off guard on occasion. You kind of look at it one day and you're just like, oh, it's got the blue iridescence today. It's kind of cool. It gives you a bit of a treat, really. But very, very cool plant. Definitely the Seismoria has to be one of my all-time favorite begonias. Moving on to a plant that is very different from what you might be seeing in the houseplant market. A lot of the times, what we're all searching for is huge leaves, and it comes from this kind of Monstera deliciosa, where you want those massive, massive leaves. This actually plays in the entire opposite end of the spectrum, where the leaves are absolutely tiny. And this is the Sephora Prostrata, and I think the common name for this is Little Baby. And when you look at these kind of leaves, you kind of get what it is. But this is a very, very cool plant. One of the big things that you will notice about the growth pattern of this plant is that even the stems that are coming out of whatever growing media it's coming from, it also has a bit of a zigzag pattern. My specific plant has kind of lost it over the, over the time. I've had this plant now for probably over two years. And I... I'm not going to lie, I had one previously and I managed to kill that one off relatively quickly. It can be a bit tricky with its lighting and its watering conditions. I have found something that works for me now, so I kind of leave it as is. I also, I'm not going to lie and say that this is a particularly fast growing plant. It really isn't. And I don't think it has got much bigger or bushier, maybe a tiny bit since I first got it. So if you do find the little baby or the Sephora Prostrata in a store and you've got an option and they're all together, again, they come across very rarely. A couple of places that I have seen them, if I'm not mistaken, is Botanical in the UK. And the plant den had it when it was still open. Unfortunately, the plant den is no longer trading. So 
That's one that had them, I think Turnit Tropical might have had it in. This is also one of these plants that if you're in the UK or anywhere that you are, if you can go into a store and pick it up, I would suggest that you do that. This is a very fragile plant. I've only ever picked it up from the store. I would dread to think how, even with the best intentions from most plant stores, how they would package this to get to you in one piece because, and I'll pick it up again so you might be able to see, if I kind of tap it there, you might see some of the leaves that are falling on and that's just with the smallest bit of movement. So, and it does take a while for the leaves to grow in. So if you pick it up, pick it up. It'll be a bit easier because then you can be a bit more gentle when you take it home. The other thing, obviously, the, the big thing about this plant is those tiny, tiny leaves and they grow kind of off the side of the branches of this plant. It tends to be a bit more of a woody kind of stems and branches. And I do think, I'll correct myself up here if not, I think this is native to New Zealand or somewhere around that part of the world. And this is kind of grown outdoors. I would love at some point to see this growing out side um, in its kind of more natural conditions. Now, I mentioned earlier on that I struggled a bit with this, with its lighting and its watering. And I will tell you what has worked for me. I had it in soil, I had it in an arrow soil mix. I give it different lighting conditions. It was a bit of a learning kind of curve, really. The thing that I found worked quite well with this plant is transitioning it slowly over into pond, letting it have a proper transition period of, I think I had this in pond without a reservoir and just watering it as I would normally for about six to nine months. And I've only just recently, so grateful, moved it into the water reservoir and it's happy and it's fine now. And I do have this in a south face, southwest facing window in the summer that has got a net curtain. So it's bright indirect towards medium light, but lean more towards a bright indirect rather than the medium. I found if you don't give this enough light, which kind of makes sense considering how tiny the leaves are, it will struggle a bit. If you give it too much light, so if you don't, don't put it in a bright, bright window, don't put it where you would have your cactuses and succulents because it will crisp up and kind of dry out all of those leaves. They are quite delicate, but a very, very unique looking plant. You, like It does catch people off guard. I've given a couple of these as gifts to friends when I find them, uh, and they're always a bit amazed. And it's what I have found with the Sephora Prostrata, either people, when you get this to this and as a gift, or even yourself, if you get this in, you might be a bit, unsure in the beginning and just be like this just looks a bit weird and it looks kind of like a bit of like dead sticks it looks a bit sickly but you will quite quickly fall in love with this plant and a lot of people that i know that have got this plant have got a very fond place in their heart for it or yeah the other side of the spectrum is you get it and you're just enamored with the fact that it looks so different than anything that you've probably ever seen before so very very cool plant as I've mentioned at the very beginning of this video, most of these plants aren't very, very expensive, at least in my location, they just don't come up as often. So I've only ever seen this come up around summertime in the UK in small batches. So when they're gone, they're gone. So if you can go across and find one of these in a plant store, or even if you find it online, this might be one that you might want to travel, as I mentioned earlier on in this section, definitely worth it for this one. I'll start wrapping up the video with my last two plants, both of which are codiciforms. This is one. This is the Philanthus mirabilis. Probably butchered that name. It could be Philanthus mirabilis. I know. But a very, very cool plant. Now, you might be able to see what I mean by codiciform. It's got a codex, so it's got a swollen, what looks like a trunk, but I think this is kind of the extension of the root system to a certain point. I might be wrong. I'm not very au fait with the terminology of codiciform plants. If you have got a passion for them and you know that I've made a mistake, please do comment down below and I will correct myself in the comments. But a very, very cool plant. My one's growing kind of weirdly. You might be able to see there that it's got a little hook. Um, but the thing about this plant specifically is what it does at night. So you might have noticed that the leaves aren't anything massively spectacular. They're kind of usual shaped leaves and they can be a bit floppy. They're very, very thin. But at night, 
what this plant does is very similar to what a lot of prayer plants do, which is closing the leaves up. So they kind of almost look like they're in prayer. It's very, very cool. And it's very cool to get this from a plant that isn't a prayer plant. I will double check whilst editing this video and see if it is anywhere related to the prayer plant. So I can't believe I've never actually researched this, but I will put it up here if it is. If not, then it's just a different plant and it's kind of cool that it does the same thing. And I think uh, scototropism, I think it might be. I might be wrong, but the story of how I got this plant in my care, and they have become, they have come out on the UK market a bit more in the last few years. You will generally get this usually in a wide, shallow terracotta pot, usually with some pebbles. I don't think I've ever checked if those pebbles are the same thing that you get sometimes in America where they're stuck onto the soil. Why would you do that to any plant? But I don't think they are. They're probably quite loose and they usually, they've got full foliage and things like that. Now, when I got this, a lot of people hadn't really ever heard of this. I think I may have heard about this plant many years ago on James Perone's podcast, On The Ledge podcast. Can you tell them a bit of a super fan? I cannot tell you how excited I was when I was doing the episode with Jane. It was a great moment. Uh, but yeah, this plant, is one that was very difficult to find in the UK back then. It has come out into the market, usually again around the summertime in small batches. I don't know if I've seen it so much this year. It was available last summer and the summer before, but it maybe it was slightly on the pricey side. You're kind of talking about mid to high double digits, I think. It's probably come down in price as well now. I get it because it can be quite slow growing and because it's a codex plant, it can lose all of its leaves in winter and the stem as well. So very th similar if you think about the Stephanie erecta, the little potato with the little kind of disc shaped leaves. That one I find much more temperamental than this one. When I first got this, it literally came to me with some of the leaves and some of the, I'm assuming they're branches off the cordex rather than petioles, I'm not entirely sure. Obviously that all got destroyed because it's so, so sensitive in the post. Put it into some soil and let it grow out. The interesting thing about this is when I, it came to me as a codex, the roots are very, very fine and they're very, very small in volume to how much there is of the rest of the plant, both the codex and the foliage. So that kind of gave me an understanding because again, there wasn't an awful lot written about the Philanthus mirabilis back then. I still think there's not that much actually available now is that if it's got small roots, it kind of works a bit like a succulent, so it will use the water that it needs, it will store it into the codex, as most codiciform plants will, and then use that water accordingly, so you don't want it ever sitting in too much of uh, a wet media. I do have this in my arrowed soil mix, as I have most of my plants that are in soil media, essentially, and it's doing really well. I've always had it in terracotta just to make sure that the, that water doesn't stay within the plant too much. However, I think I... No, previously I had it in terracotta, moved it into plastic, and now moved it back into terracotta purely because I've, I've potted it after two years of owning it. It kind of needed it because it was getting a bit too heavy for the plastic pot. But the reason why I had it in terracotta then moved it into a plastic pot was because I got to the stage with this plant in the summer, watering it every three days. And in the winter, I was watering it once every five days, which again, for a cordex plant, that's quite impressive. So I found that it can be a bit thirsty. I do let it dry out fully before I water it. So I will say that. This doesn't need bright, bright light. I find that that will scorch the leaves that are very kind of papery, but it will appreciate bright and direct light. That's kind of the zone that it likes to be in. And I will say, at least in my care, and I don't know if anybody else has got this and they've had a similar experience, it doesn't drop the leaves for me in the winter. It does maintain the leaves as long as obviously I'm keeping stable temperatures and still getting a decent volume of light, but it does keep the leaves. I obviously pull back on the watering because it doesn't use quite as much water, but I thought that's kind of cool. If you do have this plant and you see that it drops it, its leaves or its kind of petioles or branches in the winter, please do let me know down below. I'd be really curious. There's not a lot of people that I know that have got this plant or have had it for a while, so I'd be really curious to see what your experiences have been with this.
And wrapping up with another caduceiform plant that does have very, very cute heart-shaped leaves. So I'll bring it in so you can see it a bit closer. This is the Dioscorea elephantipes. Love, I'm giving you a lot of very, very botanical sounding names in terms of the scientific names that are very difficult to also pronounce. Again, I'm, I've probably butchered the name. I don't know. But the Dioscorea elephantipes, I think if I'm not mistaken, the common name for this plant is elephant's foot. But a lot of caudiciform plants do sometimes have the name elephant's foot. But this is very cool because this is a caudiciform plant that will find. If you do get your hands on this plant, I will say it can be quite slow growing. Not the actual foliage or the stems that come out of it, because that grows like a weed. This is possibly one of the fastest caudiciform plants that I have because it sends out little tendrils and then it creates these little tiny bitty hearts that do get bigger, but they're still always going to be quite small. I have got them probably about that big on this plant. I have since chopped it back. I chopped back all of its leaves. It had mealybugs at some point. It had spider mites at some point. And all I do is I chop it back down to the cortex. And within about a month, I've got a new growth stem coming up and it's happy as Larry, basically. The one thing I will say about this, again, this is another one of those cortex plants that, at least in my experience, do tend to keep the foliage. They don't grow at all, like the Philanthus mirabilis. They won't get any bushier over winter but they can keep the foliage and the growing stems. The interesting thing about this, and there's a lot of cordex plants that are called elephant's foot, I can think of the ponytail palm sometimes, I think I've heard it being called as elephant's foot, is because of the way that the cordex is. That I tend to think with this one that the cordex itself does look a bit like a turtle shell. That might just be me and I might be squinting and imagining things a bit too much, but I think that would be a better description for it. But that's just my opinion on this. Those, that element is the element that can be quite slow. So the cortex and a lot of things, and sometimes you can find, if you do a quick Google search for this specific plant, you might see some cortexes that are huge and they've got these gnarly kind of ridges in the actual cortex itself. And it really does look like a turtle shell then those do take years to get to that level. So that is the bit that does take a while to get going. You need to be careful when you get them quite young. I did get this. It was absolutely tiny. It was probably only about this big of a cordex when I first got it. And it has since grown considerably, basically. But when it's a bit smaller, you just need to be careful with how you're watering. You don't want too much moisture staying on the cordex for too long. It's fine if it's in the roots. But yeah, in terms of care for this one, it's in my arrowed soil mix and it is getting bright and direct light. This actually sits next to the Philanthus mirabilis and they're both super, super happy. But yeah, if you want a fast growing vining heart shaped leaf that isn't something like the string of hearts and will vine around things, this is definitely one to try if you can come across it. This one I have seen come up on occasion in different kind of local plant stores. Again, it doesn't come up as often, but a very, very cool plant. Generally easy care as well. Same thing with a Philanthus mirabilis. When the soil goes dry is when you would water with this. And it's not as thirsty as a Philanthus mirabilis with this one. This one, I think I water it in the summer, maybe once every couple of weeks. In the winter, it's probably once a month, basically. But very, very cool nonetheless. So that was a good new selection of weird and wonderful plants that you might not see very often in houseplant stores, in people's collections, or even in people's homes. And I know this was a second part because people really did enjoy the first one. They all requested a second one. There was a couple of people that requested weird plants that are relatively affordable. So you're going to be looking at more of the common plants there, but that you can that look a bit more interesting and different. And I have to have a bit of a think to see what I've got in my collection that I can show, but I am hoping to bring out that video. It might be a while just because I want to get my head on straight and see what I can show you that is kind of interesting looking, but relatively common that isn't a Pothos or a Monstera, for instance. But it is going to come. I do have a few more of these plants that are not necessarily common, so they aren't that expensive, expensive, but they're not going to be dirt cheap 
either in terms of weird plants. If you want another video like that, I can bring out a part three to this series as well. But yeah, I think enough of me rattling on. You've probably got sick and tired of me by this point, but hopefully you've enjoyed. Hopefully I shall see you here soon, and I truly, truly hope that you have a great rest of your day. Thanks. Bye.